I did not know that. Thanks for stopping by. I did not know that. Please like and subscribe. Please stop saying don't forget to like and subscribe. Sure, but how are we going to get followers on this thing then? <sighs> Hey, thanks for tuning in to I Did Not Know That. This episode has a guest, best-selling author Marshall Terrell. We'll talk about Steve McQueen and the sister he never knew, Carrie McQueen. We'll also talk about Steve meeting Billy Graham, how he became a Christian in the last year of his life, and more. You can click on the links to the separate chapters below. Marshall Terrell, we want to welcome you to I Did Not Know That. Sure, my pleasure. Marshall, we're going to talk about you for a, a second. Your, your bio is amazing, especially for a young guy. You've got over 25 books written, including bestsellers on Steve McQueen, Elvis Presley, Johnny Cash, Pete Maravich. Uh, you, it says you're also a, the, you were the director, executive director on documentaries on Billy Graham and uh, Johnny Cash. Well, I'm going to make a correction. I've executive produced them. I didn't direct them. Okay. Um, yes. So executive producer, which means basically arranging the interviews selecting um, the locations, um, posing the questions, you know, recruiting the candidates. There's, there's uh, quite a bit of work to that. So Marshall, tell me how, how you got into writing. Well, uh, boy, that's a long convoluted story, but uh, basically I just, I got into it because um, uh, I wanted to read about the things that I wanted to read about or the mm -hmm. people that I wanted to read about. For example, with Steve McQueen, there've been a couple of books that had been out on him but I had always felt that they missed the mark in terms of like capturing who he was, why he was famous. Uh, some books were written because, you know, he was this hellraiser, you know, or that he loved auto racing. Um, to me, it was like, well, he was a great actor, you know, <laughs> he was famous for his acting. Let's mm -hmm. focus on that. Let's talk about the movies. Let's talk about what it took to get it made. Uh, let's talk about his personal life and how he might have been different than the image that he portrayed on the screen. That was the kind of book I was looking for. And so ultimately, that was the, the type of book that I wrote. And then once I wrote that book, I discovered this love for writing. So that's how I got into it. I also have to commend you because uh, as I was working on, on this uh, last episode I was doing, I've done over 100 episodes. And... Uh, this one was tricky. There was so much misinformation uh, on Steve McQueen, and uh, you, re you really straightened me out on, on a lot of it. Would you like to talk about that for a minute? Yeah. Well, and the, the thing about research uh, back then and the research today is that, um, you know, today anybody can go on the Internet and look up something, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. Um, and because I'm a trained journalist, um, you know, and I'll hear things, and it would be very titillating to put it in the book or what have you. But if you can't prove it as a journalist, then it probably shouldn't go in there. So, um, um, so I'm, you know, my hope is that when young people come up today and when they look at um, the, the internet and they look at other things, you know, to question it, does this, is, does this true? Does this sound too good to be true? There are a lot of scenarios where you just have to question things. And I don't, and I'm certainly not a cynical person or a person who questions everything. But if there's like a little red flag that goes up, I might mm -hmm. say, let me just investigate that a little bit more. I did an episode on Steve McQueen and his sister Terry that he did or did not know about. Well, I'll tell you how I started. And that was, um, I was, doing a, the, the, the big second biography on Steve McQueen. When I did the first one, it was pre-internet, uh, if you can imagine such an era. I can. So you had to get all of your information either from the people directly, mm -hmm. uh, from old newspaper articles, from books. Um, but when I did the second second one, the internet did open up, and here's how the internet is helpful in research, and that is it can now give you access to official records, official documents, um, colleges that might have papers, whereas before you might have had to travel to those places. Now you can just access them online. Um, and so I knew that, and, and then of course, in my travels and meeting people uh, and maintaining my relationships with all the McQueen folks from the first book, I knew that I could, uh, present a more expansive um, and uh, more authentic 
biography than the first time around. And so in doing that second book, um, it ha- as just just as luck had it, Ancestry.com, you know, as you know, they update their roles every 10 years. Okay. And so the one thing from the first book that just bothered me uh, was that I couldn't find information about Steve McQueen's father, William. And and so in, in doing the second book, which I started, I think, in 2009, um, Ancestry.com updated their census rolls. And lo and behold, when you look up Steve McQueen, his father's name pops up um, with his birth date. And that's really, really essential because then I was able to take that information and then say, access military files. And so in this particular case, when I accessed those military files, it showed him listing Terry McQueen as an independent, and see, but didn't list Steve as an independent, but he listed Terry as a daughter. And I went, wow, wow. this is really interesting. And it would have had, it had her age. Um, and yeah, at the time she would have been in her early seventies and I thought, okay, well, there's still a good chance that she'd be alive. And so what happened was, is then she had a lot of different addresses and, you know, I contacted everyone with it. So I then enlisted a private detective to then try and find her. And he did. And he called and, and her daughter answered. Uh, he was asking about her and then she turned to her mother and said, mom, are you in trouble with the law? And she goes, I don't think so. And so anyway, this guy told her why he was contacting her and would she be open to a conversation with me? And she said, yes. So we exchanged phone numbers. I called her and I said, this might be the strangest phone call of your life. Mm -hmm. Uh, I believe that you're Steve McQueen's half sister. And she said, oh, honey, I've known that for my whole (laughs) life. And then I said, well, I don't understand why you didn't say anything to anybody. She said, well, you know, if I made that claim, um, you know, people would think I'm nuts. So then I said, do you happen to have any pictures or any documentation of your of your dad? Because I actually do. So um, I from his military file, I had his photo. And so when she sent me her photos via the Internet, they were a match to the photos that were on the military ID. And so that's when I knew I had the right person. So from that, that was a happy day when you saw you went, oh, my goodness, it is. Man, when you make a discovery like that. Think about this. Steve McQueen didn't even know who his own father was. Mm. Here's somebody digging into his past 50 years later and finally discovering who this man was. Mm-hmm. And with the military file, I was able to um, find out where he was all those years and develop a whole chapter on who he was, where he went. And then uh, I was able to find out people that, you know, were neighbors of his or people that knew him and talked to them and just find out exactly who this guy was. Did you do a lot of traveling when you did this? Did you do it by phone? At, the, at this point in time, you know, it, it was um, it was over the Internet and over the okay. phone. But I did meet Terry um, at a uh, Steve McQueen Festival in Slater. I, I actually was part of the uh, committee uh, putting that together and selecting guests. And so... Uh, that second year, um, we had selected uh, Terry, and she came, and so she came with her family. So I met her whole family, and uh, so you know it was just a great, joyous time. And she was finally recognized as a McQueen. I get the feelings through some of the things I read that you and Terry became pretty good friends. Is that correct? We stayed in touch. I mean, obviously, we we couldn't see each other that much because right. she lived in Colorado. And I was in Arizona, but yeah, we I would uh, we would call him just to say hello every now and then. Um, and of course, that that trip to Slater, uh, Missouri, really kind of solidified things because oh. it was just we got to spend you know yeah. three days with each other and uh, really get to know each other. And then you know when you develop a friendship, you don't necessarily always talk about Steve McQueen. Right. You, you, you talk about life. You talk about what's going on in your life at that, this time. So mm-hmm. she was a very interesting lady because she had a lot of different interests. She was just a, a real free spirit, you know, did a lot of different things. She played the guitar. Oh. Uh, she uh, 
yeah, she just she just did a lot of things. And so it's always interesting when you come across a free spirit because I'm I'm the complete opposite of that. So so she really wanted to to meet her brother, which anybody would have. And, uh, you know, fr from doing some of the reading, she she had she wrote a letter and uh, had it what she thought she had passed it to her to her boyfriend to give to an assistant producer on Bullet. And then she realized later, well, he probably never got it. Uh, the boyfriend was jealous um, and uh, it, it never got there. And then it sounds and then I came across later. It sounds like you and and she figured out, well, yeah, he did somehow uh, know that she was his sister. And t t talk about that. Well, I don't know if he actually knew or not. My feel, my, my gut feeling is, is that he knew. I, my okay. gut feeling is that he knew that his dad probably fathered a couple of other kids. Um, it's quite possible that he received the note, looked at it, and just tossed it aside. That's my gut feeling. Um, but again, you know, she said that her, her, I think it was her husband or her boyfriend at the time, uh, did not... Um, did not deliver it. That's possible too, but it's just a gut feeling that I have that he probably knew, but um, you know that that he not had he become famous. I mean, he was suspicious of people before right. as motives, but once he became famous, it was kind of like I've got it made now. Uh, I've got my own family. I don't need any other. I don't need to deal with anybody others' uh, problems. You know, they might hit me up for money. And uh, that's just kind of how he thought. And but the interesting thing is, is about ten years ago, when all these DNA websites started popping up, my both my mom and my dad discovered new family members. For example, my dad discovered that his sister had a kid, and uh, kept it from the whole family. And then my mom had a. Uh, well, and that her that her dad had a kid at 17 years old out of wedlock. But the interesting thing is that my my parents, being who they were, they were looking for them saying, oh, this is a lost family member. We got to get in touch with them. So it's, it's interesting, the diverse range of emotions involved in this because mm -hmm. they were embracing and the other side was embracing, too, because they wanted to know about their past. But uh, the only thing that Steve McQueen wanted to know was who his father was and why why he left them. And and from uh, reading about that, that didn't work out too well when he tried to uh, contact him. And I I covered that in the video. You can tell tell a little bit about that. Well, this was a stole, story told by Mike Saddam, and Paul Saddam was William McQueen's best friend. So Paul told. Mike Saddam, this story, and that was Steve McQueen went looking for him one day when he was a teen. It was probably when he was living in Los Angeles, and uh, um, and the the McQueens they all have this thing with names. They kind of do a slight variation of the name, and it was either to either stay ahead of the law, or you know just just kind of just to throw off people off their scent. So. Mm -hmm. William McQueen always went by Terrence, Terry, Steve, Stephen, William, Bill. And so when Steve knocked on his door one day, he said, are you William Terrence McQueen? Uh, or, or, or Terrence William McQueen. He had the name flip-flopped because it was William Terrence McQueen. And so he probably looked at the kid at the other side of the door and said, and my new, I knew my kid was probably going to come looking for me one day. Yeah. And he just basically said, nope, slammed the door in his face. And the only reason why he did it was because he had the order of the name wrong. Mm. But it was just an excuse, I think, probably not to uh, have anything to do with his son. I, I, I can't imagine how devastating that would be to finally work up the courage. You find your dad and then that would happen. Yeah. And, and the weird thing is, is maybe 20, 30 years ago, uh, well, I had a family member who didn't know his dad and I had to contact his dad on his behalf and set up a meeting. And that was a very, very strange situation. So it's, as I write about those things, I've sort of been involved in them in, them in one way or another. So I think it gave me a better insight uh, into my writing.
Writing about people like Johnny Cash or Steve McQueen, sometimes you come across embarrassing information about them. How do you decide what to write and what not to write about? The What I try to do is, would, would this information ruin this person's legacy? Okay. I don't want to be, I really don't want to be the guardian of anybody's legacy, mm -hmm. but I know things about these guys and other legends that if, if I let it out, it would absolutely devastate their legacy. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be the person to do that at all. So um, um, you have to weigh, yeah, the devastation of that information. And then you always, yeah, you have to take a humanistic point of view from it too. Like, would you want, would you want the worst thing that you ever did as a human being to come out? Let's say you had a bad day, you know, and you're going to be judged. You're going to be judged for that the rest of your life. You know, mm -hmm. so I just, um, the other thing I go by is, has, have other people written about it? So for example, with Steve McQueen, he was a philanderer. I wasn't the first person to break this news. You know, um, he's had other people write about that. He's had, uh, wives write about that. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to me, then that's, that's kind of fair game, but it's also fair game in that how you write about it. If, if you write about it, just, just to tilt, titillate somebody, that's one thing. But if you write about it and show this is how it devastated this marriage, this is, this is how it led to this, because like, for example, um, it was, you know, it, it was, uh, and this is, again, this is how you disseminate information. And that is when it was written about Steve McQueen that, you know, auto racing led to his, the, the demise of his first wife. And, you know, you, you, you listen to that and you go, well, that's, that's ridiculous. You know, if it's mm -hmm. the wife, she's probably scared, but she loves him and this is what he does. Um, and, you know, with, with, with others, like with, with George Harrison, the, you know, he got way too deeply into religion and that broke up his first marriage. No. That's mm -hmm. not what did it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, you, you, you have to be able to tell the truth, but you also have, you can tell it in a classy way, I think. As well, I remember growing up, uh, and we, we discussed this a little bit, Paul Newman, he was always held up as the guy who, you know, stayed by his wife. Why go out for a uh, hamburger when you have steak at home? And then you find out that wasn't, ex <laughs> that wasn't exactly true. Right. And it wasn't just one time either, because I, you yeah. know, doing my research on McQueen, I'd, I'd talk to <clears throat> people who were buddies with uh, McQueen, and then I'd find out um, other, you, you just hear things in passing about these other stars um, who were there, mm -hmm. and who would say something, and, you know, you just, it goes in the back of your head, like, okay, it wasn't just this one time, it was, but on the other hand, um, you, you have to understand that as a, as a superstar, uh, you know, it's offered to you every day on a platter and, you know, it would take a superhuman being um, to, uh, to, what's the word I want to, I want to use? Resist, <laughs> resist temptation. Yeah, to resist. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. There's a saying, never meet your heroes. Now, I know you were a big fan of Steve McQueen growing up and since then, he's become kind of an icon like Elvis and James Dean. Did the things you find out, did the things you found out about him affect the way you viewed him? No, I always try to maintain a, a distance in terms of uh, when I write about somebody. Of course, I respected him. Um, and, you know, the question has always been asked of me, would I, have, would I have liked to have met him? The real question is, would he have liked to have met me? Because he was deeply suspicious of journalists and writers. Now, of course, he had some friendships with some writers, but uh, for the most part, um, he um, he did not. He was very suspicious. So me personally, I don't like being around suspicious people. Mm -hmm. I've been around people of his celebrity status, and I've seen how they are suspicious. And uh, it's, it's deeply uncomfortable. Um, there was one country music star that I had, I wouldn't say befriended, but he was always on guard and it's just, it's no fun to be around somebody. Right. Like if I would have uh, been like, you know, like to have been around him or not. Cause I, I'm just kind of loose and free and, you know, I take people at face value. Um, and um, so, but you know, 
again, to be objective, you got to mm -hmm. be in his position. Um, I sent you an article, I think last week, about a woman who said uh, maybe we should not call Steve McQueen the king of cool anymore because, uh, you know, she mentioned all his flaws, which he had flaws and which everybody does. Uh, what, what was, what's your reaction to that, that he should no longer be called the king of cool? Everybody's got flaws, and um, I, I can guarantee you as a journalist, uh, if I started looking into that person's background, I could find <laughs> some things that are uncool. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you, you just can't, um, you, you can't judge somebody unless you are in their shoes. So uh, Dean Martin's a person who was also considered the king of cool, but, you know, there are some things that he did in his background, you know. Definitely. Uh, so... When you're under the, you know, you're in the public spotlight and uh, you're under a microscope, um, it's not a comfortable place to be. And uh, but you're also offered uh, the fruits of life. And um, ninety nine percent of those guys, you know, they uh, they 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 take advantage of those situations. So, you know, it's hard to I, I don't like today's society where we like to go back 50 years ago and apply the same standards that we have today to yesterday, because they're not the same standards. Let me ask you, so who was the real king of cool? Was it Dean Martin or was it Steve McQueen? I'm going to go with Steve McQueen. Okay. And so why? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. Why? Um, I thought he was cool because he did his own thing. He paved his own way. Um, he didn't wait for the phone to ring in Hollywood. You know, he was not one of those actors that waited for the phone to ring. So in the meantime, he pursued the things that made him happy. So I think what makes somebody truly authentic is that they never go out of style. Mm -hmm. uh, they do their own thing. Uh, I mean, when you look at McQueen, he's not just a movie star. He's a he's a fashion icon, and he dressed the way that he liked to dress. He didn't dress to impress anybody. He uh, he pursued uh, classic cars and motorcycles, just because that was just his thing, you know. And now it's just this multi billion dollar industry. He pursued uh, flying, antique flying. You know, that's that's a big thing now. So uh, he did things that that uh, were an evolution of his own personality didn't really care what other people thought and uh, just did his own thing. So I think that's what makes somebody cool. Yeah, I, I agree. What, what I find interesting too is, especially with Dean Martin, he was so unlike his public persona. And if you've read much about him, he, he hated parties. He hated going out. He liked to stay home and watch Westerns on TV. And that's not the image that, that, that was out there. He was not, he was not this swinger that liked to party all the time. That was more like Frank Sinatra was like that, but he was not like that. That's correct. Yeah, and yeah. I read several, I read several books uh, about him. So yeah, that was always kind of shocking. And I once interviewed his uh, daughter, uh, Deanna, for an article. And um, so, yeah, she she had some really interesting things to say about him. Well, I just, um, I have a book in the can that's wait, awaiting release it's about elvis presley and colonel parker mm. and it's a different take on colonel parker uh everybody speaks about him as being a villain right in this book i had access to a lot of records and transactions and uh it showed a, a different side uh of elvis of uh, uh colonel parker and that he was a fair man and that oh. um uh, everybody always likes to say, well, he took 50% of uh, Elvis Presley's uh, uh, income. Well, that's not true. There were four or five different pots of money. One was for recording, film, um, merchandising, um, and then touring. The, the first three that I listed, he took 25%. Mm -hmm. uh, with touring, he had formed a joint venture partnership with Elvis. And that required Colonel Parker to employ about 10 people underneath them to prepare for these tours. Then all the expenses were taken off the top for Elvis, meaning jet fuel, uh, entourage, all these people. 
So that was taken off the top before they could split any of those profits. So, you know, the, the touring profits weren't necessarily that great for Colonel Parker. Um, and then in, in, let's let's say that he did get 50 percent. Well, you have to remember he um, he wasn't just his manager, but he was his publicist. He was basically essentially his lawyer because he looked at all the contracts. Um, he he performed about four or five different functions. Usually a manager just kind of guide you along in your career. Again, he was publicist, uh, promoter, um, you know, managed, lawyer, uh, did all these things for Elvis. And, uh, you know, I mean, when Elvis went into the army um, or when he was drafted, you know, the colonel was the one that said to him, you know what, this might be good for you. This might be good for your image. Uh, and and as, as it turned out, all those guys that started out with Elvis in the 50s, Mm -hmm. You know, by the end of that decade and into the 60s when the Beatles came, they were essentially doing the state fair circuit. You know, Elvis had made the transition from, um, you know, rock star to movie star um, and still kept his music career intact. Now, a lot of people criticized the movies, but that's where the money was going. That's mm -hmm. where the money was coming from. The rock and roll stuff wasn't sustaining his lifestyle. So, um Again, so it's a it's an interesting take on Colonel Parker and his role in Elvis's life, and again, done with somebody with a very objective point of view, um, saying, "Okay, well, let's let's look at this uh, without any sort of emotion." I've heard I, I I've had written some boxing books, and I'd heard the same thing about you know the promoter Don King, and the guy some guys that I knew and that were close to boxing, they'd say, "You know what? He's actually not a bad guy." That's just his image. Uh, well, so well, a lot of the villainous characters that you you hear and read about, probably true, but there are some, you know, where the, the thing with, with Colonel Parker, he had this very famous saying, he said, the artist always wears the white hat. And so that meant if, if, that, if there was any negativity or bad publicity, the Colonel would take it on mm -hmm. behalf of his artist because his artist could never be blemished. Smart. Very, very yes. smart. Very smart. Very smart. I mean, this is a guy that came from another country who had to learn um, a new language. And um, he was everybody always talks about the carnival background. Well, there's there's a lot of um, there's a lot of um, uh, same uh, situations in rock music and in, in the carnival industry. It's it's it, it kind yeah. of translates very well. So, you know, there wasn't any. Uh, there weren't any rock concerts in the in the 30s and the 40s. It was all carnivals. But mm -hmm. he took he took what he learned from that and applied that. Um, and he and Elvis, you know, blazed these incredible trails together. So I'll ask you one last question. Um, in the last year of his life, Steve McQueen be became a born again Christian, and uh, and I've wondered if if Terry had reached him. At that point, and I know you can't say for sure. Do you think he may have uh, responded to her at, at that time rather than when he was at the height of his fame with he was doing Bullet when she tried? Do you think uh, there might have been any difference? He would have been more receptive to the idea. You know, he when he moved to uh, Santa Paula in the last year of his life, he really mellowed quite a bit. And, um, you know, he became friendly with the community and he was certainly just more open. Um, wasn't as paranoid, um, was still very, very popular, still considered a superstar. But, um, you know, him becoming a born again Christian really had changed and mellowed him quite a bit. So I would I was I would be of the belief that perhaps that he would have been open to meeting her or um, somehow corresponding with her. And uh, because, you know, he was no he no longer had that wall. up, mm -hmm. So. I think it perhaps could have had a really good ending. Yeah, he changed quite a bit. Um, you know, a lot of people thought that he changed because he knew he had cancer. Mm -hmm. But um, when I was doing my research, I came across an old Liz Smith column where it said like in April of 1979 that he was starting to go to church at uh, Ventura Missionary Church. And um, he was diagnosed with cancer in December of 79. So that was a good six months before so um it was authentic and it was genuine and it, it definitely made a, a a big change in his life and 
when he had cancer and, and he knew that he was going to die, he had something to hold on to. He had mm -hmm. something that gave hope. And he died with Billy Graham's Bible on his chest, I heard. That's right. Quite and the I story. I have Bible in my hands. You have? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it's in the, Barbie McQueen has it now, but uh, she asked me to hold on to it for uh, several years. So I kept it in the safety deposit box. Um, and every now and then, for some reason, I'd have to pull it out. But, you know, I'd see that Bible and uh, it actually had a couple of presidential phone numbers in there. Really? Yeah. Wow. So it wasn't just his signature to Steve McQueen, his inscription. It had underlined, underlined passages, notes, some okay. phone numbers in there. It was really quite a, and it's a very, very small Bible. It's like a little hand Bible, but it was something that Billy Graham um, had uh, carried with him um, on travel. And by the way, I've done a, a, a book with Billy Graham with uh, uh, with uh, author and pastor Greg Laurie. And, um, uh, you know, people ask me of all the 30 books that I've done, who was the most impressive? And I'd have to say it was Billy Graham that was the most impressive human being, mm -hmm. simply because of the amount of things that he was able to accomplish in his lifetime. Mm -hmm. And, you know, McQueen made great films. Um, Johnny Cash, who had written a book about, you know, wrote great songs, but Billy Graham inspired people, gave them hope. And, you know, he lived to the age of 98, but he was doing what he did for like a period of seven decades, just hard charging for seven decades. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I've gone to presidential libraries before, and, you know, they, they base a lot of their the library and the work that they did in four or eight years and with Billy Graham, he did the same amount of work as the presidents did um, over a period of seven decades. So that's why I think he's really an impressive human being. Oh, I can hear that theme music playing. So we have to wrap it up. Marshall, thank you so much for coming on and talking about uh, all your incredible books. Uh, they're amazing. And I also want to thank you for being the first guest, the first time we've ever done an interview on I Did Not Know That and You Were a Good One. It's my pleasure. And I'm, I'm glad that I was the inaugural interview. And I, I hope that you will continue to do more. Yeah, you made my first one a piece of cake. <laughs> well, good luck to you. And, and, and thank you for having me on the show. Yeah.